want to thank you all for coming. This is really important. You should all be grateful for these candidates that took time out of their busy days to show up and answer questions, introduce themselves to you, and just let you know what, what's going on in, in our local government, as well as we have a couple of guests here. We have Dennis McManus. He's for the clerk of courts. His election will be in November, is it? Yes. yes, and also Katie Toomey, the State Registry of Deeds. So I thank you for coming to our event. Okay, I'm Sue Clark, I'm the director of the Senior Center, and I just wanted to go over the guidelines of this. We've been doing this a long time, and it seems like this is the way it works the best. This annual event is held so our senior population can make an informed decision when they vote on Tuesday, April 3rd. Each candidate will be given five minutes to make their presentation. Presentations will begin at one end of the table and continue down the table. After each candidate makes their presentation, there will be a question and answer period. So once everyone's done, we'll open it up to the floor for questions and answers. Questions from the audience are limited to two, but because we're not a full house, I might let you go for three. Um, questions must be directed towards a candidate. No debates are allowed. So you guys can't be, you know, like duking it out up here. <laughs> we'll have none of that. Okay, there'll be someone timing each candidate. Nancy Potter will be, she's our timer. She's got a giant book. So every time, after five minutes, that's it. Um, she'll signal you when they reach their five minutes, and that's, that's that. So, I think we should open it up to the candidates. If you would like, you can come up to the podium and do your, your introduction, or you can, sit, you can stand at where you are, it's up to you. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. I have a, a spare microphone, so, how, Jen, you want to start? Do you want to come up to the podium? Of course you do. <laughs> to show them how it's done. Okay. Uh, you want to, uh, you just show them how to do that. I don't know if that's an easy example. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Montion, and I'm running for re-election to the Library Board of Trustees. I am a lifelong Fordian with a precocious seven-year-old daughter who is also from grow up here. I've worked in finance, customer service, management, and as a community advocate, so I have a diverse and applicable set of skills that will continue to benefit the Library Board of Trustees. The Milford Town Library is a cornerstone to the Milford community, and my objective is to continue to do everything possible to help maintain and improve upon the existing programs, policies, services, and technology it offers. I will work to ensure that everyone in our community can enjoy the library today and in the future. The Milford Town Library should always be a safe, welcoming, and comfortable place for anyone in the community to use. I have worked tirelessly to ensure that projects related to infrastructure and technology are investigated, vetted, and completed in a timely manner, and that programming is offered to all demographics of our diverse community. Whatever role the Board of Trustees needed me in, I have responded with flexibility and readiness, whether it needed a trustee, an accountant, a contractor, an advocate, a secretary, or a minutes keeper. I have played an active role and have never missed a meeting, either regular or special, and have participated in a majority of the subcommittees that the Board has convened. I want to continue to all the work I have started and look forward to tackling the work that still needs to be done. Working with the Board and the Library Director as a team, to ensure that the Milford Library stays relevant and flourishes in the evolving world of technology and community demands at the forefront of my goals. I kindly ask for your vote on April 3rd so I can continue my work to ensure our library remains a shining star of all local libraries. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Next up is John Erickson. He's running for the Board of Selectmen. Good morning, everyone. John Erickson, candidate for Board of Selectmen. I want to thank everyone for coming out this morning and for those that, tune, that are tuning in uh, at home. Uh, again, John Erickson, um, my history, born, 
I'm sorry, so <laughs> I, I'll lean a little closer. Uh, so John Erickson, lifelong resident of Milford, Milford Public Schools, graduate of Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and uh, 30 years with Erickson Electric, our family business, as an electrical contractor. Um, as many of you here know, 15 years ago, I went to work for the town of Milford uh, as the assistant building inspector, and then later went on to full-time employment with the town of Milford as the building commissioner. It's this experience that has given me uh, my deep insight into town government, my understanding of the problems, the challenges, the successes of each department. Over the years, I've worked very closely with nearly every town department, including police and fire, board of health, planning and engineering, the selectman's office, the finance department, and again, this was daily activity and working closely with these individuals, with the other members of their departments, and really learning town government, and again, the problems, the challenges, and the successes that uh, each have had. And what I'm gonna uh, bring forward in my opening remarks today is a little bit different than I have in some of the past forums. And what that is is we have a need in this town, in this community, to bring people together much closer than they are now. Our success will be working together going forward. Um, I've mentioned my you know, record of collaboration and product productivity with working with other individuals and departments as a whole, and I see that lacking right now. Uh, I think we can look at some recent decisions that this board has made uh, to show that uh, they don't appreciate participation by all of our community members. If we look back to members that were controversially uh, removed from certain boards and committees. We can go back to the geriatric authority. We can look at the zoning board, and I'm not mentioning individual names. Uh, we can look at our youth commission, where, where the decision to remove one member without explanation uh, was just devastating to all of those that are in this community and working especially close with the youth commission and our kids. So, then we can look forward and see what's going on right now. We have a board of selectmen that has refused to give our police chief, our highly successful police chief, Tom O'Loughlin, a new contract. That's, that's, again, devastating to this community. And equally devastating is the fact that these decisions are being made without explanation um, because this board just doesn't have enough uh, respect for us as a community or enough care to explain their actions, explain their decisions. And when I look at all of these decisions, what I ask is, do you really think that these are in the best interest of the town of Milford? And what I will bring forward is this record of collaboration, this knowledge and understanding of town government, and the promise uh, that I will always explain any decisions that I've made, that I will make, that I always, always have explained, and uh, I promise to do the best I can for the town of Milford. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next we have Kenny Evans, Board of Health. Ken, do you want to go to the podium? Yes. Excellent. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Kenneth Evans. I am chairman of the Milford Board of Health, and I am currently a candidate for re-election. The Milford Board of Health strives constantly to improve on the programs that we currently have, as well as developing new programs. Some of the new programs that we have put in place in the very recent uh, past uh, the uh, made possible the continuation of the Leadership Academy at the Melford High School. This was an, uh, a, uh, a function that was previously paid for with a grant, and uh, the grant ceased to exist, and the Melford Board of Health stepped in because we have in our contract with uh, Republic Services certain funds available that we can use for the community, for the betterment of the community. So we stepped in and financed that leadership program that would have been lost otherwise. Uh, with our support, the wellness nurse coordinator for the Melford Public School, uh, we, we 
uh, supported that position, and that was to uh, increase awareness of the harmful effects of sub substance abuse. And uh, we did that by acquiring and televising films uh, detecting the harm of substance abuse uh, to the uh, school health and high school community. Uh, uh, what is it? The uh, the television program that runs at the at the Norfolk High School, which is closed just for that. Uh, we initiated a newsletter for all our food service establishments, and that brought awareness to them of certain points that we look for during our inspections, and uh, we improved on that by informing them of exactly what we expected of them. We set up regulations for landlords and for tenants to comply with waste and recycling uh, responsibilities. We increased neighborhood inspections and monitoring, monitoring for our, our road control uh, problem. We initiated plans to expand curbside recycling to include <coughs> textiles. We sponsored a nurse at the senior center to advise and be of service to our senior citizens. I am asking for your vote on April 3rd so that I may continue to serve on the Melford Board of Health of the Town of Melford. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ken. Next, we have Megan Hornberger. She's running for school committee. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Megan Hornberger, and I am a candidate for school committee. Having an opportunity to speak with you today is truly a pleasure. I was, in part, raised by my grandparents. Both of my parents worked full time. My dad, early in his career at the Bo at Milford Shoe, and then later in his career at Bose Corporation. And my mom is a public school teacher. My hours between school and dinner were spent in the homes of my grandparents, Francis and Helen Fitzpatrick, and George and Rita Hall. And for that, I am incredibly fortunate. There is so much for children to learn from our seniors. And for me, those lessons included respect, etiquette, and the value of hard work and community service. I am grateful that my three children now have the same opportunity with my parents including my dad, Bob Holland, who's here today. I was the vice president of my class at Milford High School when I graduated in 1995, and the vice president of my National Honor Society when I graduated from Providence College. I earned my Master's of Business Administration and my Master's of Science and Accounting from Northeastern University. I am a certified public accountant and have spent my career in various roles in internal and external audit. My 18 years of corporate experience has afforded me the opportunity to work for companies based in Boston, New York, and New Jersey, to travel to 10 countries, and to serve as a manager and mentor. I even had the chance to meet Warren Buffett. I am proud to say that community service has also played an important role in my life. For the four years I attended Providence College, I volunteered at a local youth center for underprivileged children. While working at Benjamin Moore's corporate headquarters in New Jersey, I volunteered at a nearby assisted living facility. And when I moved back to Milford, I was able to participate in an incredible program at Milford Regional called Compassionate Companions. For the past six years, I have volunteered in the Milford Public Schools. For two years, I served as co-president of the Memorial PTO, and for four years total, I served in the Memorial and Woodland School Councils. I am committed to this town and to our children. And I believe a strong, a strong school system is one of the critical pillars of a strong community. My chosen profession of auditing adheres to a code of conduct that's founded on four principles, integrity, objectivity, competency, and confidentiality. And I believe that I embody all of those values. 
I also believe those values are critical to sit on the school committee. I am a hard worker, an active listener, and an effective collaborator. Skills that are required to be a productive member of this team of seven. If elected, I will focus on improving measurements of district strategic planning and long-range planning, and or to ensure that all decisions are made not only with all children, but all taxpayers in mind. My fundamental goal, if elected, will be to bring thoughtfulness, accountability, and collaboration at every opportunity. I respectfully ask for you to cast one vote on April 3rd for Megan Walker. Next up we have Sarah House. She's running, also running the school committee. Sarah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Howe, and I am running for school committee. First, thank you to Sue and the Senior Center for organizing today's forum. Participation in our community is one of the things that makes Milford a great town, and it is my passion for the community that makes me a great candidate. I believe schools are the heart of a community, and it's my wish to serve our town in this capacity to help ensure our schools are the best they can be for all the children of Milford. I want to be on the front lines of supporting the district plan and help to operationalize those plans and set policy to ensure all Milford students are able to meet their potential and beyond. I am a nine-year resident of Milford with three young children who are currently attending or will soon attend Milford Public Schools, Allison, Billy, and Anna Jackie. I found so many opportunities to participate in our community as we have so much to offer. I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 2. My husband and I both volunteer at school as much as we are able. Our children attend and participate in community use programs. We're regularly found on the soccer fields and so much more. My family is committed to this community. After receiving my Bachelor's of Business Administration and my Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, I've spent 17 years in human resources with technology companies, including 10 years at EMC, and most recently, a large bank, Santander. That is how you say it, Santander. <laughs> <laughs> I have deep experience in employee engagement and developing programs that engage employees in a culture of accountability. I know how important engagement is to success in the workplace. It is even more critical that students are engaged and participating in their academics and other learning and growth opportunities. Students bring their whole self to school, all of their confidence, anxieties, and interests, and it is my desire to find ways to educate that whole student, to support their development academically, as well as support the development of skills that are critical for success in life and their future careers. Skills like resilience, time management, communication, empathy, and responsibility. This whole self approach will translate into engagement and academic success. But I believe will also contribute to engagement in our community and elsewhere. It is critical that we continue on the path of improving academic success and college or career readiness through specialized programs and focus on critical needs areas to ensure students are able to learn to the best of their ability. This includes looking closely at all programs to ensure they're valuable and the return on the investment can be identified. Milford High School has taken significant steps just this year to advance students' college readiness and begin talking to students about college early and often. While they have some programs in place that will aid in career readiness, for example, business and banking and hospitality, there's certainly more work to be done on that front. My experience in career development as a human resources professional will be invaluable to this effort. Finally, I believe this town has a lot to offer, and we, as a community, need to paint for ourselves and others a more fair and optimistic picture of our town and schools. This is a community that is engaged and passionate with educators who work hard and strive for excellence. We have a diversity of thought and beliefs and foster an inclusive environment that should welcome all to participate in the education process. The opportunity, I believe, for Milford Schools is limitless if we work together. 
I ask for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Also the school committee, Laura and Jim. And Jim. Milford resident. My husband and I have three daughters, ages five, seven, and two. My grandmother Mary was a volunteer and an active participant in program and events here at the Senior Center for a number of years. I graduated from Milford High School in 1999 and College of the Holy Cross in 2003. I later earned my master's in accounting and my MBA from Northeastern University. I worked in public accounting for five years at Ernst & Young before making a career change to become a teacher. For the last nine years, I have been a business teacher at Hopedale Junior Senior High School. I want to use my experience as a teacher, parent, and businesswoman to have a positive impact on our educational system. I am looking to take the next step having already participated on PTO boards and school councils at Shining Star Preschool and Brookside Elementary School. I have a very solid understanding of the issues facing our children in our schools today. I can bring several different perspectives to the table. I interact daily with teachers, students, parents, administrators, and local businesses. As a resident and a taxpayer, I want our children to be competitive in today's world. I believe in public education, and I would like to ensure that all of our children at every level are challenged to reach their full potential and beyond. Some of my goals are to increase partnerships with local businesses for real world exposure and experience for our students. To support the social and emotional learning to help make our schools safe for learning. To increase elementary enrichment opportunities such as foreign language. And to work to ensure a fiscally responsible budget using my knowledge of both education and also finance. I am looking forward to the opportunity to serve the residents of Milford. I will not take this job lightly. I will work hard for every child. My record demonstrates that I am dedicated and I can work well with others. I respectfully ask for your vote on Tuesday, April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Next up, Will Kincaid running for a seat on the Board of Selectmen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Will Kincaid, and I'm the current chairman of Milford Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Sue, and your staff for hosting this candidate's forum, and thank you all for attending. I'm married to Lisa Almeida, who's an assistant principal at Woodland School. We have a nine-year-old son named Caleb. I've been employed by the MBTA for the last 12 years, and I serve as the director of automated fare collection. In addition to working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the last 20 years, I am the president of the Friends of Milford Area Special Athletes, and a former mayor of Prospect Heights, something I'm very proud of. You have a choice in this election between two good candidates. John and I have known each other for many years and know each other's families. However, we do have different paths for moving forward, moving Milford forward, and you'll be the people who choose the candidate and the path you prefer. Prior to serving as one of your selectmen, I served as a town meeting member, a member of the Milford Pond Restoration Committee, a commissioner on the Milford Housing Authority, a three-term school committee member and chairman, and as a member of the Milford Finance Committee. I've enjoyed serving as your selectman for the last three years, and I hope to serve for three more. It's a great deal of work to do it right, but it's very rewarding. Whether it's keeping a tight rein on finances, negotiating the acquisition of the water company, or collectively bargaining with our employees, it's been an honor to serve. I've had the opportunity to work with some very talented people. I've been able to get to know them and their families. Holding monthly office hours has allowed me to have personal meetings with constituents who prefer to meet face-to-face -face rather than over the phone or email. I've also received hundreds of calls and emails from constituents, and I've tried my best to be timely and responsive. On a personal note, there is no other place where Lisa and I want to raise our son. We want Caleb to grow up here and for him to see all that Milford has to offer. Thank you again for having me serve as your selectman, and I ask for your vote again so I can serve for three more years and continue to fight what I what I continue to call Milford Pride. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Next up, Margaret Mayak. She's running for a, a seat on the Board of Library Trustees. Margaret. Good morning, everyone. 
morning. My name is Margaret Myatt, and I'm running for the Board of Trustees of the Milford Town Library. I am seeking your support and your vote. I'm running because I'm a huge fan of the library, and I want to contribute to its continuing success. I have served as a trustee for three terms for nine years, from 1998 to 2007, and I enjoyed my service tremendously. Back then, I did not seek re-election because of a job change, but now I am retired and I have time and enthusiasm to serve again. I've lived in Milford for 35 years and I have demonstrated my commitment to the town in many ways. As I mentioned, I was a library trustee in the past. Also, I am a longtime town meeting member. I serve on the Milford Commission on Disability and I was the first president of the Friends of the Milford Upper Charles Trail. Milford is a great town and I'm really enjoying giving back to it with my time and my service. I will be able to dedicate time and service to complete the objectives of the library's current five year strategic plan. And I will always advocate for library resources at the local, state, and even national levels. I am an avid public library supporter, and I look forward to serving as a trustee again. My family and I are enthusiastic library users, and we know what a fantastic resource it is for so many people. So again, my name is Margaret Myatt, and I'm asking for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Next up, we have Michael Visconti, Mike's running for school committee. and I'm running one of the three open seats on the school committee. I am running because I would like to ensure that every student leaves Milford with a quality education. I am a lifelong resident of Milford. I have served the town in, 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 in many different ways. One that I'm proud of is I have been a town meeting member for over 40 years, and I have a 100% attendance record. I have not missed one town meeting. And when I say I'm a town meeting member, I'd like to qualify that by saying I am an active town meeting member. I don't like, as some of you may know, I don't go to town meeting and sit there and rub a stamp every time before town meeting. I, 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 you're going to hear a lot of good ideas and programs proposed from the other candidates for school committee. And I will, I will agree and support a lot of those. But what separates me, why should you vote for me? What separates me from the other candidates? For one, I am very budget oriented. I know that a lot of these programs can be put in place still keeping within the current budget, maybe with minimal increases. A lot of the seniors and veterans out there I know struggle to pay their taxes and still have enough funds left over for their necessities, for some of their medications. I will work hard to see that we accomplish the goals of the school committee while maintaining the current budget with minimal increases. Now you may ask, well, how do you know I can commit to trying to work hard to do that? Well, I'll give you one good reason. I am one of you. I am, I struggle every year, every month, to, to allocate the, the few dollars I have to set aside to pay my taxes. And I know it's an obligation and I do that. And I do that willingly. I, I, I think that it's important to keep our seniors in mind when we're instituting programs of any type. And I will do this and I will support these programs as long as they are not excessive budget breakers. So please, on April 3, please cast one of your votes for Mike Visconti. And keep in mind, and you can tell all of your senior friends and veteran friends that a vote for Mike Visconti is a vote for you also. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next we have Bernie White. 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 Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank 
plan to running the school committee. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn White. I'm running for school committee. Uh, 22 years ago, my wife and I got married and built our home here in Milford. We've been incredibly happy here. Uh, I started off my career as a software developer, did that for about 18 years, and now I'm an IT, IT consultant with my own business. Um, I have to admit that until 2010, I wasn't terribly politically active. I coded mostly occasionally, and um, I, I didn't really spend too much time one way or the other following the issues, but it, it was the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court that was my way to home, uh, and that I needed to do more, uh, not just in, this, in the, the national politics, not just in state politics, but locally as well. Um, uh, more recently, um, I took a look around town and realized that I hadn't done that much uh, for the local community. I joined the Milford Area Humanitarian Coalition, which does the school lunch program. Uh, I'm sorry, the summer lunch program. Um, and uh, I also became a town meeting member. And so um, now I'm looking for another way to get back to the town. And I'm hoping that you'll. Uh, see that I would be a good fit for the school uh, committee. Um, the issues that I'm really concerned about in town are uh, school choice, where uh, we have a sizable number of um, parents taking their kids to other school systems. I feel that we have a lot of great programs here in Milford, and we just need to do a better job of informing uh, the parents uh, so they make a better decision. Um, we're starting to integrate technology more in the classroom. This is something that's really right up my alley. Um, I feel that I, I can help the school system uh, meet their technology goals. Uh, and thirdly, I would like our kids not to make the same mistake that I made um, and become more politically aware. Um, and in order to do that, I would like to see a more robust civics program in town um, so that they know how politics works, how government works, and uh, to try to get them more involved, um, both with voting and with um, participation in other areas of town. And so um, the school system is the you know, cornerstone institution of our town, and I have a lot of passion, um, and uh, I would really like to dedicate myself to the school. And uh, I would ask that you please say, I like white on April 3rd. Thank you. Next up, we have Christopher Wilson. He's also running the school committee. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you, Bill Fabota. My name is Christopher Wilson, and I would like to represent our community on the Milford School Committee. Along with my wife, Kathy, we have called Milford home for more than 17 years. We have raised our two children in this community, where they have always attended Milford Public Schools. Beginning at Shining Star Preschool, along to Brookside Elementary, then to Woodland, and now both attend Stacy Middle School. I have always found it important to be involved in my children's education. That is why I chose to serve on the school councils at every school they have attended. The school council is an organization consisted of parents, teachers, and administrators that work collaboratively together to develop school improvement plans and the student handbook. I'm a Northeastern University graduate with a mechanical engineering degree. I work for a local Milford design firm as a senior mechanical engineer where I develop cutting edge technology. I am a son of parents who are both in the education field and my wife is also in the education field at a neighboring school system. I also serve on the Milford Community Use Board. I am the vice chairperson for the Milford Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I am also a town meeting member. As a school committee member, I will strive to bring Milford High School back to a level one ranking, develop and grow vocational programs for all students as they look towards their future, support the social emotional learning initiative set forth by our special education department, stay fiscally responsible within the schools and the town's operational budget, and ultimately provide the best education possible for all local students. 
The Milford community is a diverse population with a strong history of hardworking individuals. It is time for this community to work together to change the tide of perception and acknowledge the great students that Milford sends out into this world. I am looking forward to your questions this morning, which will provide more detail of my desire to serve the community, better our schools, and ensure every Milford student is challenged to their potential and beyond. And it also needs to be done in a fun and safe environment. I respectfully ask for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next up, I would like to introduce Joe Early. He is our <coughs> district attorney. Joe? Good morning, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm going to briefly touch on why I ran for this office 11 years ago and some of the major things we've been doing that affect Milford every day. 11 years ago, I ran on a theme of prevention. I wanted to prevent crime. And I thought the best way we could do that is at the juvenile level, working with our youth. So we took our best and best, brightest prosecutors, put them into the juvenile court. And what we find there is that behaviors can be changed and modified so that we actually have seen our juvenile delinquency numbers going down by working with the Milford Police Department, working with our judges, working with probation to make this better. Two, the biggest social problem we have right now is the opioid problem. Literally, we're losing two people every three days in Worcester County. I started a Central Mass Opioid Task Force. And one of the things that we've done, I'm real proud of, is started public forums. We've worked all over the county. Worked down here with Amy Leone and Chief O'Laughlin. We brought the author Sam Canones, the author of the book Dreamland, to talk to you about where this problem started, how it's affected us, and why it's killing so many of our young people. Three, I started the first diversion program in Worcester County. What we're doing is taking kids who get arrested for minor offenses and keeping them from getting a, ju a juvenile or an adult record. We divert them, postpone their arraignment, divert them out of the court system. They give us eight hours of community service working on projects, ball fields, parks, things of that nature. But we also keep kids busy in the best prevention tool, keeping them around responsible adults between the hours of 3 to 6 p.m. That we know works. The Department of Justice tells us this. The Atlantic model tells us this. Common Sense tells us this. Next, we started a community outreach program. Community outreach. We're in a different school almost every day talking about the opioid problem and alcohol, texting and distracted driving, our number one most requested program, bullying and internet predators, safe dating, drugs and alcohol, cyber safety in the mock trial. We started our first accredited child advocacy center in Worcester County, partnering with UMass to help the victims, the young victims of sexual abuse, so that they're not traumatized further. They come in before us on a two-way mirror and they give one interview. We guide them, help them with the system. Not every interview leads to a prosecution, but we help that child, we help their family as best we can. Finally, our unresolved homicide unit. We put this together right at the beginning. I put this together. We called it the cold case unit at first. And John Bish told us, Father Molly Bish said, don't you dare call it a cold case unit. We call it an unresolved unit because the family, to these families, the pain is every bit as real as it was the day they lost their child, lost their loved one. We've solved 40, 30, 20-year-old murders. We, this type of technology has also led us to make an arrest in the Vanessa Marcock, Vanessa Marcock case in Princeton. These are some of the things I'm proud of, and I want to continue to be your district attorney because there is so much to do, more to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next up, we have Katie Toomey. She's running for the State Registry of Deeds. Good morning, Sue. So thank you for allowing me to come today. Um, the Registry of Deeds became an open seat in January of this year. You might have met um, the gentleman who's held the seat for the last 46 years. He's very active in coming to all the communities. His name is Tony Bigliotti. He has decided not to run. In light of his um, announcement, I decided it was time for me to step up. I've never run for office before, but I want this job. I like this job. It's an interesting job to me. I'm a private practice attorney. I'm coming out of 17 years of practicing law, and it's time for me to step up and do my government duty. The Registry of Deeds, the question is, what is it? If you own a home, you know what it is. It's where your deed, your mortgage, and all your other title documents are recorded. Worcester County is enormous. Our Registry of Deeds um, is 55 cities and towns. It stretches south as Milford, as north as Athol. Excuse me, I'm coming over a cold. Um, 
what my goal would be to help uh, understand the registry of deeds is first and foremost to maintain the impeccable record keeping standards that are there now and make sure they maintain them that way. But I'm looking at community outreach. I've talked to other registers of deeds in my practice of law and I've realized that we can do better in Worcester County because of that geographical spread. Other registers of deeds actually set up hours at local town halls and senior centers, senior centers for informational purposes. They send employees out. They give you tutorials on how to do things, what these standards are, what the criteria are. They also will accept some recordings in hand and bring them back to the registry of deeds. We do have a lot of electronic filing, but that's not for everybody. Right now it's only limited to attorneys and what the Commonwealth refers to as frequent flyers. But for the average citizen, it's 26 miles one way to Worcester from Milford. I'm aware of that. I just drove down here from Worcester. I'm a Worcester resident. It's not easy. It's 52 miles round trip. I'd like to be down here more often. You have a lovely town. It's a great place to visit. Um, it's my first time running, and I appreciate your time. And sorry I'm cutting it short, but I'm losing the points. Thank, Thank you. you, Katie. Thank you. Next up is Dennis McMahon. He's running for Clerk of Courts. Thank you. Professor so Lattice, I guess. Sorry. Yes, absolutely, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, Dennis McManus, I'm the current Clerk of Courts in Worcester County, which obviously includes Milford, and I'm running for re-election. Before I give my uh, you know, two-minute spiel, I'd like to just uh, congratulate everyone who has spoken today. Library trustee, selectmen, school committee, I'm very impressed you guys have all done a great job. I'd like to give you a As uh, the clerk of courts, uh, I can tell you, we run a great office. We deal with serious cases. We get about 4,500 cases a year in each and every year. We only have seven court rooms. The cases we deal with on the civil side are the most serious medical malpractice, business contract disputes, wrongful death. And on the criminal side, they're the most serious cases that Joe Worley's district attorney's office brings. The murders, the rapes, the drug trafficking. We, uh, our motto, our office motto is dignity and speed. We know the people who are there on these cases don't want to really be there in court on these type of cases. So we try to treat everyone with respect and dignity. How do we deal with speed? We modernize technology, scanning, paperless, will soon be a paperless office at the end of the uh, uh, fiscal year. Also, we added two courtrooms. We added judges. So cases are getting done quicker. But my office reduced employees. So we're speeding up cases, adding judges, or reducing the costs that it takes to uh, deal with the case. Also, I have a very experienced office. My last three hires have hired three strong female attorneys with over 60 years of experience. We can get you the answer to any question. Any question you have, we'll be able to get you the answer. And last, I would just ask that if you ask around, there are a lot of lawyers out there, ask about our office. We always have great reviews, and uh, I hope to keep it going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. That was great. You all did a great job. Now, I would like to open up for some questions. Does anyone in the audience have a question that they would like to ask one of our candidates? Yes, uh, Dr. Janelle, I'd like to address this to the uh, Margaret and to uh, Jan, who's running for the uh, Board of Library Trustees. Uh, Milford is very fortunate, and we have a a 501c3 group called Milford, Friends of the Milford Town Library. Um, either one can start. I'd like to know what your relationship is with the Friends and how you view their work and support of the library. Uh, okay, so the question is about uh, Friends of the um, Milford Town Library and my relationship with them. I think I've probably been a member since we moved into town. <laughs> um, I love the programs that they bring. Um, I enjoy getting the newsletter. I think it comes out twice a year. Um, and I've actually been a participant in one of the programs. That was a, about three years ago. Um, I was a presenter down in um, the Granite Room. I know that the, um, the friends have provided uh, I think they provided the um, flat screen TV. They've uh, had over $13,000 in um, uh, benefits back, giving back to the library. They support the microfiche. I think it, I used that once when I was doing uh, some research, but I haven't used it in recent years. And I really like the museum passes. I have used those a lot. 
Um, and I also attend the uh, book sales. Um, one year I was one of the volunteers for that. Uh, twice a year they had the best book sale on the planet. And I know they get a lot of members because um, the members get to go on Friday afternoon. So you get the first dibs on the best books. Um, so I'm really glad that the friends exist. Um, I enjoy participating in the programs. Um, I think the friends of the Milford Town Library are absolutely integral to the success of the library. Um, I myself have also enjoyed all the programming, um, including the book sales where uh, you find way too many good deals. Um, you are correct, they do do the museum passes, they do the microfiche. Um, we've been working, the, the board as a whole has been trying to work with them on the garden that is next to the library to um, bring that back to its grandest state. Um, they, they provide monetary benefits, but the programming that the friends work with the director on are absolutely amazing. And without them, we wouldn't be as awesome as we already are. So I am grateful for everything that they all do. And I hope that we continue to have the relationship that we have both as a board and on a personal level as well. Another question? I'm addressing this to uh, all the candidates for the school committee. Could you explain to me the difference between high honors and honors in the high school? Well, the, the, the difference between honors and high honors is, a, is, is simply a matter of grades. If you attain a certain grade and maintain it, you can, you can become an honor roll student. If, to become a high honor roll student, you have to attain a higher grade. Now, I am not certain exactly what those grades are, but I can tell you this. They are, to a certain point, very subjective because each teacher grades differently yeah, so that there is really no objective grading that is carried on in the school. We need to look at a way, it's very difficult to, to, to establish an objective grading system in a school when you have different teachers grading differently. If I was a teacher, I might give you an A, whereas another teacher might give you a, a D or maybe an F, but I would give you an A. <laughs> Thank you. So I think the difference is, you know, fractions of a grade point average, right? Um, if, you know, the, I don't know what the cutoff is, but I'm certain at one point, uh, at some point, the grade point average is high enough that you're high honors. In other words, to, to Mike's point about, um, you know, subjectivity of, of grades and stuff like that, hopefully our teachers are um, educated enough and fair and, and that, they're, that they're not being wildly subjective in their grading. Um, it's interesting because on a professional level, we, we, I run performance management for um, Santander Bank, and that's assessing people's performance on a you know, um, multi, you know, few times a year anyway. And we talk about um, rater bias and things like that. You can have a halo effect if you like a student more than another. Uh, but ultimately, I think that high honors and honors, they're the students that are excelling. Um, and I think teachers are, are you know, grading as fairly as they can, and um, and it's fractions of a, of a point difference between high honors and honors. I guess the only thing I would add to that, sorry, is um, the new principal of the high school actually is doing a recalculation of GPAs. Um, initially, sort of the higher AP classes were not more heavily weighted, and now they will be, and so I think we'll see that um, start to come through in terms of performance, um, but otherwise I agree with everyone else's statement. Mike, I'll let you speak after everyone else has, okay? No, we don't read by. <laughs> we don't debate. You know we don't debate. Okay. Okay. But could you please sit down for now? <laughs> So I would agree that um, it's an internal calculation. It's determined by the principal and the administration as to what is going to qualify for high honors and honors. Typically, high honors is a 90, an average of 90 or better, and honors is an average of 85 or better for the quarter. Certainly won't bore you with everything that's being said because I do agree with 
uh, the other people that are running that for the breakdown of the honors to the high honors. Um, and it is good to see that Josh Oden has, uh, Alton Scarby, is uh, looking at the GPAs and how they're calculated for our students uh, to be, it's gonna be looked at uh, from a, a better standpoint from colleges. So again, it's, it's an improvement to the grade point average system and it's gonna help improve the, the middle school system. Yes, I'll just echo what uh, my other uh, <laughs> compatriots have said, um, that the high honors is just a, a higher, higher grade point average, and that it's also a good thing that, um, that is being reformed. Okay, Mike, please. Briefly, please. <laughs> I will be brief. You gotta keep them in check. Believe me when I tell you, there is no way that the grading can be objective when you have different teachers giving different tests. So if I give you a test that I made up and I give you an A, how can that possibly compare to a, to a, to a grade that another teacher gave an A to another student but gave them a different test? It is impossible. The only fair way to compare grades is with standardized testing. And that is done with your MCASs and your SAT scores. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, another question? Gail? Uh, I have a question for Mr. Kincaid. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't have to remind you what a terrible winter we've had. And as a senior citizen, it has been extremely difficult getting out of the house. I frankly have been snowbound. Uh, I did get two calls from the senior center checking that I had heat and light and all that. But if I did not have them, what provisions have you made the senior citizens that are in that situation? Is there a place that they could, somebody could take us to, uh, you know, be safe? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, when I was on the school committee, we had what we called the generator project. We spent almost $300,000 putting in a full-size generator at Milford High School uh, for just that. Now, it certainly hasn't been activated to date, um, and I'm not sure at this point what would cause that to be activated, but that is the, the emergency center in town, and we put a generator in that was large enough to actually heat keep all the food that's stored there and everything completely operational. It just doesn't factor in emergency lighting and things of that nature. It can keep the entire building going. So we do have a place that's activated. We do, or at least the three years that I've been on the board, we do leave that to our public safety leaders, both the fire chief and the police chief. They were both very involved with that project. So um, if you felt like that should have been activated at some point already this season, um, I, feel bad, I feel bad about that. Um, and I will certainly relay that message, and we should probably circle the wagons on that. But we do have a place for it um, where there's, again, bathrooms, showers, and heat and lights. So that was done quite a few years ago. And that's why, even though we took a little bit of criticism at the time for getting the size generator that we did and spending the amount of money we did, we didn't want to just have something that would keep one refrigerator going and a couple of emergency lighting. So we do have that. Okay, I personally had no problem. I did not lose any power. But I know a lot of people that did and end up going to hotels or having to try to you know, get to somebody else's home. But the traffic was so bad, the web, you know, the roads were bad. A lot of people, like myself, were basically snowbound. No, and I appreciate that, because I actually had two friends stay with me as well, because we didn't lose power on my side of town. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a very valid point. And again, since we did make that investment, um, I'll make that a topic at our meeting on the 26th. I appreciate that, Gil. Yeah, I think it's really important, you know, to take care of us senior citizens that are alone. No, you're right. That's a great point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Aida? Um, I guess the board is left a, a similar problem is that I, if you live on a corner and the city plows come and plow all that snow, they always put it in the corner place which makes it very difficult to see out when you're trying to get out. But even worse is that they have actually piled snow across my driveway taller than I am. Now there's okay. no way, if I had an emergency, there's no way I could get out. My plow person comes, but sometimes he comes in the evening. Yep. So I am locked in. Would it be possible to direct those people not to cut off your exit for the corner? You know, 
they always put it in front of them. No, and I... But there's plenty of place further up the street they can put it in the yards of people. I don't mind a fair share in my yard, but when they block my driveway, that really upsets me. No, and I've heard that a lot over the last three winters. Um, you know, our highway department does a great job. They have less folks than they had when we had a lot uh, less miles uh, of road years ago. But this is town government where there's different fiefdoms and different levels of responsibility. Now, a lot of that comes based, that's when personal relationships come into play and good pro professional relationships. I call Scott, um, uh, our Scott Crisofulli, our highway surveyor. I'm, I'm very close with his, with his foreman as well, John Perry. I've made a lot of calls. They go out there, they react, they remedy them best they can. However, um, I do, for the most part, have to direct those to the highway department. So I take the calls, I take the, and as I will do with you as well. He has been very good. He has actually come he does a great twice, job. twice to my driveway and opened it. But oh, I'm sure. Do that to the power people know better than to block it. Other places where they put yeah. No, and I certainly don't want to speak for Scott. He's independently elected, but he's very, very receptive. Um, and I know that he has hands, his hands full as well with a lot of contractors that are out there doing the work for the town. Thank yes, thank you. Um, what I would add to that is, or I, I enforce is that uh, the highway department, the highway surveyor is an elected official. And I would encourage everyone here to reach out to their elected officials um, and express their concerns because they will be met um, and embraced. Uh, and it, it, sometimes it's just an awareness factor. He can't, you know, he can't see the job of every employee at every moment. Um, and I'm sure there was no, you know, ill intent, and that's why they came and and then resolve your situation. Um, but what, I, what, you know, some of the things I hear, what I encourage people to do is to reach out to the proper departments. Uh, if I'm your selected and you express a concern, I'll certainly relay it. But I don't want to give any undue e effort to your individual problem at the expense of somebody else's problem. What I would encourage is reach out to the department heads, express your concern, because they're dealing with mul a multitude of problems. And just because a selectman reaches out, that may not be the best use of their resource at that time to, to satisfy that one complaint or that one issue when there may be, you know, larger issues that, that, you know, individuals aren't recognizing at that time. But so I encourage people to reach out to the department heads, the elected town officials in these departments because they're all listening and they have a great concern um, for everyone in this town. Okay, I have a question for Mr. Evans. Um, you spoke about the uh, recycling. Now, I am very conscientious about recycling, and now they're starting to do uh, textiles. Will there be another bin for the textiles? Can they go out on the sidewalk with your other stuff, or do they have to go to the dump? No, our plan in increasing the recycling is to have separate beds for the textile. We haven't implemented that at this time. At this time, any textiles you have do go to the transfer station and they're recycled from there. But our uh, hope is that we will develop, uh, we're planning on developing a program so it'll be picked up at curbside with the separate bed. Now, frankly, I try to avoid going down to the transfer station. I had never gone down there, and I had to go last year. After my husband died, I had to go, and I explained to the person there, this is my first time here. They were not very helpful as telling me where to go and how to put, what places to put things. So I kind of hesitate to want to go down there again. Well, I, I, without knowing who you spoke to, it's difficult for me to, to do anything about correcting that. Yeah. However, we do emphasize with our employees uh, now that they should be helpful and polite at all times. Uh, in fact, uh, we just dismissed two of those employees in the last couple of months uh, for various reasons. So we do try to stay on it and make sure that they do the job Remember that they are servants of the people. Okay, thank you. Um, because 
the tax rate on the water, or the, the bill of the water keeps going up. And I know <coughs> someone who knows rate increases. Is it the Board of Selectmen? I'm sorry? Who approves the raises for the water? That's a great question. That's a great question. The Department of Public Utilities at the state level. Oh, okay. They have to make their case. We appeal it best we can, and then a hearings officer actually makes the decision. Of course, I'd like to know what they did to improve the system with all the money that they got. They haven't. Exactly. So why are you buying it at a high, at, after they got the money, we're now buying our money back for no work that was done? Does that make sense? Uh, it, it does. Um, what, what was supposed to happen after the boil water crisis a few years back is the state, again, the DPU and the water company resolved an, uh, pretty much, a, I don't want to say a punch list because it's huge money, but they were supposed to do all these capital investments. They, they, out of the $20 million um, in that first, first five to six years, they spent 1.2. So they, they put the filtration system in, which we still, the state keeps telling us is great, it's state of the art, they did a great job. All of the other capital improvements that were supposed to be done over that time period have not been done. So they kept the money? Well, no, no, they didn't, well. Instead of using it. They didn't use it, but they didn't, you know, it, it's part of their, their revenue. So they didn't get anything, uh, you know, additionally based on coming up with that, with, with that capital improvement list. But that was a lot of, uh, that was, I think that's the reason why even all three members of the board currently, obviously including myself, when I first ran, because like, I did not, I was adamantly opposed to purchasing the water company. And the only reason, and, and a lot of it I could share as, as much as you want, and some things I still can't, but the reason that I think all three of us gradually have come to the conclusion that the town of Milford and the residents need to have control over their source of water, because that is actually the number one complaint that I have got, I won't speak for my colleagues, that I've gotten over the last three years being on the Board of Selectmen. And again, they could tell me to pound sand when I call, they don't. Um, I, we've been able to work out some issues home by home. Again, we're reacting to, to, to phone calls rather than having control over, the, over the, the water. And I think at this day and age, I think there's a reason why in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there's either four or five public water companies left. All other towns and cities have said, you know what, we need to, we need to have ownership over our water. Private, I'm sorry, private companies. My point is, since we've already had these rate increases and they haven't used the money for the improvements that were promised, why don't we deduct that from the sale price? Um, that, and that's being, that's still, that's very much part of the negotiations, but the state allows the water company. All, all private water companies to try to reimburse their spending from former years. So because of even legal fees that they've, that they've spent, and this is again 1865 legislation we're still going off of, which is amazing in itself. I, I've learned an awful lot. Um, in that 30% rate hike, it's a, very, it's a strategy. So they say, hey, if we go to the state with a 30% increase, hopefully they'll either you know, cut the baby in half, so to speak, or come to, uh, come to a number that they can still um, get reimbursed for anything they've spent since the last one. And since the water company has a history of not doing annual raises at two, three, four, five percent, which a lot of the, a lot of the, other, the other four water companies have a history of doing, the Ford Water Company has strategically done it every five or 10 years, and we get hit with 30, or a few years back, a 50% increase. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add or confirm with that is that the Milford Water Company has been remiss in their responsibilities. They had capital improvements that they should have been making over these last five or, or six or eight years since that, that big crisis of 2009. Uh, and they've certainly been remiss in those responsibilities. And this is why if we have a chance that this, that this purchase does go through at, at, a, at a justifiable cost, because that's going to be negotiated, uh, not negotiated, but determined by um, this, this lawsuit that's in place, but when we have the chance to take over the Milford Water Company, we need to do better, we need to do it right, and we need to um, de devote the resources to its improving it. That should have been done all along. Question? This is not a question, but uh, for all the big salaries you people are not receiving, you should be commended for showing up 
Mm. It, to me, the 90% of the people that are lazy, they don't care, and all they do is squawk and scream. But for you people, I want a big hand. Thank you for coming and so forth. Thank you, Nick. Question? Yes. Uh, first, I want to apologize. This question is sort of lengthy, but I felt it needed to be for background. This question is uh, directed to Selectman Kincaid, and it has to do with transparency in local government, the marijuana referendum, housekeeping articles, and party life. Uh, Mr. Kincaid, you claimed in the most recent forum that you were aware of Sierra Natural, but not pro Verde laboratories. However, back on January 9, 2017, Board of Selectmen meetings, Selectmen were aware of these two businesses, and they would enter the recreational marijuana business. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, I've got several others, so why did the board choose not to reach out to these two businesses before the referendum? Also, you claim that you were absent from the two meetings where the ballot language was initially ch changed to ban all recreational marijuana businesses. Let me refresh your memory. You were present at the June 5th meeting that adopted the original language of the referendum, which would have banned the retail sale of marijuana. You were absent from the July 10th meeting when the original language of the referendum was remanded to the planning board. You were absent from the July 24th meeting where the senior member of the Board of Selectmen decided that the language of the referendum needed to be changed. You were present at the August 7th meeting where the board adopted the revised language of the referendum which banned any recreational marijuana businesses in Melbourne. And on the August 21st meeting, we board remanded the revised language of the referendum to the planning board. So the two meetings in the revised language, you missed only the one, in issue one. At the second meeting of August 7th, when the revised language was adopted, Bill Buckley made a motion by reading the language of the referendum and stating that it met the requirements of the legislation. This took him about two minutes to read. Uh, junior member second the motion, taking him five seconds, and it took the chairman four seconds to make it unanimous. At no time was there any discussion of the referendum question, and then a final vote was not made. Uh, as I said, there was no discussion of the merits of the revised language. There was also no discussion of the other option for the referendum language that was in the selectman's package that night. Uh, Executive Director Bolani had provided an option that met the requirements of the legislation which would have banned only the retail sale of marijuana in Milford, just like the original referendum on July 5th. So my question is, how does an issue that would have such a great impact on the quality of life in Milford become a routine housekeeping article? Also, in that same vein, on October 24th, it's under your stating as a housekeeping article, is that you voted by just accepting the, the motion to allow $5,400 uh, stipend for the water commissioners. Also, this was never gone, presented to the personnel board. Um, and so my question is, where is the transparency? Okay, thank you, Dr. Heller. Um, first of all, I think it's also fair to know that Dr. Heller isn't here as a neutral party figuring out which candidate he's gonna vote for. He's a John Erickson supporter with a sign in his yard, which is fine, but I think that that's also part of transparency. Second of all, I may have misspoke when I talked about the majority of the votes that I consider housekeeping articles. Again, firefighter toll roads, fundraising, things of that nature. Um, as for the water company, and I do take this quite personally, which I generally don't, a lot of you may not know, my wife was diagnosed with cancer last June, and she had an adverse reaction to both the surgery and chemo, so uh, even on the school committee for nine years, I had a perfect attendance, or nearly perfect, I have a nearly perfect attendance at the Board of Selectmen meeting. So when I tell you that, yes, I did, I was absent, but I think I had valid reasons considering I wouldn't leave my bedside, my wife's bedside for almost four weeks. So excuse the anger, but I'm gonna leave the answer to those questions at that, thank you. Um, to speak about transparency in town government, it's a message I've been trying to deliver for the past few months during this campaign, is that we have leadership right now that 
makes controversial votes, important votes without discussion and without explanation, and that's the biggest fail that I think this leadership has right now. Another one, Gail. Now, just to let you know, Gail said to me when she walked in the room, don't hand me the microphone, I don't have any questions. <laughs> so here we, here we are, Gail. Okay, the other important thing that I forgot to ask about is uh, what is going on with the police chief, uh, you know, rehiring or renewing his contract. I personally think he's been doing a great job. I think the police department has been very, very responsive whenever I get to any interaction with them. And I'd like to know, you know, what's going on there. And I would like Mr. Erickson's response on that too. The other question is, would that be resolved before the new election or would it hold over till the new selectman comes in if there is a, a new selectman? Sure, great question, great follow-up. Look, this is, you know, there's a reason why Al Correa calls this the silly season. I think if there aren't enough issues, people make them up. Um, like I said, I have known Tom O'Loughlin for 20 years. I've known him for years before he came to Milford. He does a great job. He's a stand-up guy, and I have a great relationship with him. With that said, I also have to be a selectman and run as, this year being chairman, run meetings and respect the fact that I have two colleagues. So there's three of us that have different questions, concerns, um, things I, I, I'll touch on because quite honestly, this is where I'm, my hands are kind of tied. Uh, he is an employee, he has rights, he's not here. And quite honestly, I wouldn't speak specifically about negotiations anyway, it just wouldn't be right. And quite honestly, it's probably not legal. But what I'll say is that Tom does a great job. When he came here 16 years ago, he turned around a department that, quite honestly, wasn't doing too well. So with that, there's been some differences of opinion on vacation rollover, um, sick time. I'm trying to remember specifically what else that you can talk about. Um, but I've negotiated, I did, I did three terms on the school committee, a term on the housing authority. I've been negotiating contracts in Milford for almost, I don't know, 15, plus years, it's not strange that different people have you know, different opinions and we have to come to a common ground. I will tell you that it's one of the four positions in town that, that I think is so vital and so important that if I can lead my committee to get to a point where he has a unanimous support, then that's worth the wait a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I'm not sure it's gonna be resolved prior to the election because we put our strategy sessions uh, which I initially scheduled between me and my colleagues on hold once Jerry Moody announced his retirement. Because I will tell you, that made some people, especially in Town Hall, panic. They've had the same attorney in town for 40 years. We're, gonna, we're doing interviews tonight for the three finalists that the search committee are recommending to us at 6 o'clock. That will be televised. Uh, are we gonna find someone with 40 years experience? No, Those, these three, a search committee said that they're going to, uh, we're gonna be impressed with them, and that's what I'm looking forward to. After that, as I said in the newspaper, once this is resolved, we'll go back. The Chief's contract now expires, June, currently expires June 30th of 2019. He's looking for a three-year contract to begin on February 1, because legally he has to retire on his birthday, which is January 31st. So his last three years, but as we've done in the past, when we get to the point of having a contract, we can always retro it or make it valid through the date. That is all something that Milford has negotiated all too well. So again, my opponent, John, or anyone else can certainly talk about the board, but when there's also relationships that maybe all three have with the gentleman, you have to be very careful because we all know each other, we're all in the same town, and I really want to see us come to something where we can all agree to. Because I think when it comes to a police chief, a fire chief, or a town administrator, to have unanimous support behind you makes a big difference and it leads to a lot less questions and concerns. Thank you for asking that, Gail. For not asking any questions today, you've asked a lot of good ones. <laughs> if I can comment on that topic. Um, what I can tell you is the police chief is in a one-year extension on his contract, which is an automatic provision, um, which happens when there is no action uh, to renew by either party. I have the contract, I've read it at length, I've discussed it with him. I've made a 
public records request to the town of Milford, I have the chief's notes from the last two negotiation meetings. And what's been presented isn't, isn't what I'm uh, gaining from reading those notes. What I can tell you is that there were two meetings with the chief, one in November, one in early January, the 8th or the 9th. Um, there's been no future meeting scheduled. When, when someone wants to present that they're working on it, it'll get done. That's not what the actions or the inactions indicate. Um, when you look at those notes, and uh, they're public record, if anybody wants a copy and wants to request them, you can look at some of the discussions that have happened in that, that meeting, which has led to some of the current open meeting law violation accusations that are on the board, on the table with the board of selectmen at this moment. So you're not getting the full answer. You're not getting the facts. You're not getting what's really been going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's probably because it's campaign season and it, you know, the truth just can't be told at this point in time. But there has been no effort, not enough effort by this board of selectmen or the chair to renew the police chief's contract when all of those um, statements that have been made about the chief are 100% true. He's improved this community uh, in more ways than we can express. Um, but the facts are there's been no sincere effort to renew his contract. Yeah, if I, if I can, one moment. Uh, uh, Bill, I'd just like to ask you, what's the possibility of retaining Jerry? I know Jerry's gonna stay around for a bit to handle various items, the water company sale and other things. Would it be in the town's best interest to retain Jerry to handle the chief's contract instead of bringing somebody in that really has no knowledge of the situation. That's a great question too. Uh, the chief is one of the few people and himself also being an attorney. Jerry has never had anything to do with negotiations with the police chief. He negotiates directly with the boards of selectmen. But one thing I'll add that, that John mentioned, and if anyone does get the note, um, John, if that's the case, you're running against the wrong member because those notes paint the exact picture that I just said when I'm representing myself. So again, if we have the same notes, the chief accurately represented some stuff, some stuff he may or may not have, that'll be decided. But all I can say is I'm speaking as myself. My two colleagues aren't up for re-election. I am. Question? Question? Uh, just a question on, regarding the chief. Uh, in the paper the other day, I read where uh, Mr. Kincaid said that, and he mentioned it today, that uh, because of Jerry Moody's situation, that they uh, were putting uh, the chief situation on hold. It's my understanding that they appointed a Blue Ribbon Committee, it was an excellent committee to do the search committee for the uh, Newtown Council. Um, so my question is, does the Board of Selectmen only handle one major issue at a time? but they can't multitask. Dr. Hallery, you're in rare form. Um, all I can say is that uh, we're just talking about the water company. We're talking about uh, the 14 illegal apartments that have been taken down over the last three weeks, that some go back to 2001 here at 42 Main Street. Um, what else? Doing our attorney search. Uh, I gotta tell you, over the last three years, I think we've seen more action from the Board of Selectmen other than a lot of talk. So um, I just believe in getting results done. I don't plan to plan. I move, and sometimes it's aggressive. I know I look like a librarian, and I'm not, but I gotta tell you, there's a lot of things going on in this town that people aren't happy with, and they want it to be fixed. And I made a promise three years ago to move on things. And I have moved and moved and moved, and I'm not gonna stop. And I know I've stepped on a few toes, believe me, but I'm not apologizing for that. It took 30 or 40 years to get some of our buildings and some of our neighborhoods in the condition they're in, and it's not going to be overnight. I do sound aggressive, but I do think we need to be, because you know what? There's a whole other generation, and you know what? All these school committee candidates are representing them. I'm so proud of them, because I'll tell you, that is the most thankless job in this town. And if we ever lose our schools, the town will follow. We have to keep our schools clean and safe, we have to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe, and I think even something, and that sounds like a simple message, that is what people want. And I think we're accomplishing that. Thank you. Question? Does anyone else have a question? Oh, okay. Oh, stop. Do you hear that? 
No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Apartment houses on Green Street. Apartment houses on. What about the pet? Yeah, what we've asked and what the police chief has been, been doing for us is providing, we're finally, and he had to, he said his current technology uh, couldn't handle it, but what he's doing, he's dealing with multiple technologies to produce lists for us. So we're finally, over the last year and a half or so, putting a connection between um, the addresses that have the most calls to them via the police department and we're matching them up with other health code violations, with the Board of Assessors, with the Building Department. And again, those offices may report to different folks, some even independently elected boards, but we're doing a really good job of, being, of talking to each other. We, I called, uh, in January, I called for the first time ever an all boards meeting, and the vast majority of boards, and at least their representatives, showed up. We met at Upper Town Hall. We actually had quite a few people considering Sometimes apathy that's out there, attend and watch. And I gotta tell you, the, the feedback that we got from the department heads and the elected boards was phenomenal. And they wanna now meet quarterly because we're finally talking to each other. Because town government is very siloed and in fiefdoms, and there's different realms of responsibility and authority. But, you know, it's amazing. You get people in, around the same table in the same room, you can actually resolve a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and I was very proud of that. As for Green Street, I will look at the address on those buildings. I got a complaint yesterday about an address on Green Street, but I'm not, which I passed, which I passed on because we use the town administrator as the collector of all these information. I usually get two to three calls, which isn't a lot, about complaints because what I've tried to do is really empower people that are living in the neighborhoods to know that they can call me confidentially and I will pass on the complaint. That's how we ended up shutting down and having uh, an an overcrowded issue, I'll leave it at that, on West Street. I had to go there, I had to sit there, I had to see how many kids were leaving one apartment to get on a school bus. I went there and counted the amount of bags of trash on trash day. Never mind that the one neighbor that has lived there in that neighborhood for over 50 years was even getting a good night's sleep. She shouldn't have to leave her home because of things like this. I'm not going to apologize for that. If I have to do it, I will keep doing it. I have a full-time job. But I will keep doing it. I love this town, and I'm going to continue to fight for it. And I'm not going to be a selectman for 30 years. That's not my DNA. But I want to at least set it. I want to just make sure that these folks that I'm sitting with, they're going to be the ones that are the selectmen after me. Because you know what? They care about this town, and they're fighting for the same children, and hopefully our grandchildren. I know my mother's grandchildren. So I'm just going to keep, I know I'm a broken record, but I'm just going to keep pushing that home. When we have to make changes to boards, we're going to do it. When I promised I was going to do that. Things have to change, or they don't change. If I can add to that, um, if you're going to make changes to board, uh, the residents and voters deserve an explanation, and, and that is not taking place. Um, Selectman so Kincaid and I clearly have different approaches to how to achieve results in the town of Milford, for the town of Milford. Um, if he has to camp out, or any selectman has to camp out at a property to inspect it, then our town officials aren't doing their job. And I was one of those town officials for many years. Um, I, to the Green Street property, I inspected it at one point because it's required to be inspected and certified every five years, and it passed. When we talk about this building over here on Main Street, there were violations going back to 2001, and I was a part of correcting them, and they were resolved. They've recurred by different ownership, and that's what we have to stay vigilant at. When you talk about correlating police calls with zoning violations or health violations, that just shows a serious lack of understanding of, of the dynamic the situations in town government. I've spoken at length with many town officials, the police chief, numerous police officers that I've done inspections with, and there is no correlation between 911 calls for uh, illegal activity or otherwise with building, zoning, and health violations. There just isn't. This is the example of our leaders don't listen to our department heads uh, and other uh, members of town government that know what's happening in this town. Uh, they think they know what's happening. They think they have an answer, and they're not using the resources that are there. And this, this just completely highlights uh, the different approaches that Mr. Kincaid and I have to achieve results in Milford and um, town government. Good morning, everyone. See if I can take a little bit of heat off uh, Will and uh, John. Uh, quick, uh, first of all, Ron Wizier, I am a current uh, board member of the library trustees. 
So I'm going to direct this question to the two ladies that are up for election. And I know uh, I want to go with what Nick said. It is a commitment to be here. It's a commitment to put yourself forth. Um, this is the second one I've been to, and out of the three members running, you two are the only ones that have attended, which I greatly appreciate. If you could give us one thing, either currently or one thing that you see, that is a concern that needs to direct attention to the library, I'd like to know why we need you there to help us move forward in the library. A lot of stuff, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go twofold with one item, and it's our budget um, and how it is affected by something that Mr. Kincaid talked about earlier. Um, in that we have a union, um, and the negotiations for the contracts significantly impact our budget, both one year in our and in our five-year plan. Um, and I've talked to Mr. Kincaid uh, prior to today, we, at the round table as a matter of fact, um, in that we are trying to get better communication between the Board of Selectmen, the Union, the lawyers, the director, and, <laughs> and everyone else involved. So <coughs> the budget is the overarching theme, and then below that is making sure that there's communication between everybody in town and in the library and the Board of Trustees so that everyone is on the same page and that we continue to be able to provide programming within budget in conjunction with everything else that has to go into that. I mean, there are always going to be capital infrastructure prog prog uh, projects, there is always going to be technology improvements, there's the five-year plan, but if you look at our budget, our salary line is the largest item, and that affects everything else that falls underneath it, so that needs to get addressed first, and then everything else will continue to fall into line. Um, I remember the, the budget battles um, back in, during my tenure, and uh, it, it does never it never seems to go away. So, and also, the, um, if adequate budget is given to our fantastic staff, um, they will address the, the programming and the needs and 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 what the how the library can better serve the public. So, outside of the um, budget um, issue, I'd like to just raise the um, safety issue in terms of working uh, with the police department, the safety departments, and um, knowing that I had worked with so many different parts of the town and that I would be able to um, foster communication between different parts of the town to ensure the safety of our, of our children, um, coordination of safety with the youth center down the street, and um, working with a program that will move us into a future where everybody can feel very safe. Thank you. As a, as a current member, I'm not going to comment on anything you said. The safety, though, uh, is an issue since I've trained uh, both the library staff and the uh, youth center staff and CPR, so being safe all along is, is very important. This one is for the school committee, and again, appreciate you being here. Uh, last one I attended, I know one of the big issues is our high school ratings are not the best. And I don't like to talk in general terms, I like to be more specific when I want to uh, get something done or I want to see something progress forward. So, I know it was brought up as a perception problem, however I see it as kids coming through school. They see what they're in, the parents see what they're involved in when they get to high school, so therefore they choose to school choice and move to another another school. It, it's nothing that they perceive, it's something that they see. What would be the one thing that you could work on that would change that? Is there something uh, a direct, is there something, a, a direct issue you could act right away that could raise our ratings? I, I do not like to talk in generalities either, or make categorical emotional statements. So let's look at some facts. In the past 10 years, the college board sets a benchmark for which they feel is a, is, a, is a grade that students need to attain in order to be successful if they pursue college after high school or if they pursue other 
job opportunities not requiring college degree. In the past 10 years, Milford school system have failed to meet that benchmark where other surrounding towns have far exceeded that benchmark. Medway, Millis, Hopkinton, Franklin, Blackstone Valley Tech. Now here we have a technical school that is exceeding the academic benchmark set by the college board and Milford has not done it in 10 years. We need to enhance our academic programs, reading, writing, and math, and sciences, to bring our, our schools up to the same level as the surrounding towns, solving at least two problems. Number one, the perception issue. If I'm a parent, and I, I'm sending my child to school, and I see that the students from the surrounding towns are scoring much better than the, than the students from Milford, then that might be where I choice my, my child out to. We need to increase our, going back once again also to the, the, the grading, standardized steps is the only way to compare one town or one student to another. That is what we need to enhance. Thank you. It's a great question. Thanks, Ron. I think um, when we refer to the perception problem, what I mean when we, when we say that is that Milford isn't turning out great kids, and that's just not true. I think, unfortunately, we are a level three school, both level one through five, where five is the worst. You know, at that point, you're in receivership by the state, which obviously is a place we don't want to be. But Milford is such a diverse population that it's really challenging for students who don't speak English to come in and take these challenging standardized tests and do well. And so it's an average that yields your rating, and so obviously we're impacted by those students. So we need to take the limited amount of resources we have and allocate them such that we can help bring those kids up while still providing the kids at the top the great education that they're getting today because they're getting a great education. Milford has 19 AP classes as a beginning and a ton more offer. For me personally, in terms of specifics, because that was the question, I think more math intervention. Um, our ELA scores have improved due to programs we've implemented. I'd like to see more on the math side to continue to raise those scores. Yeah, so uh, to piggyback a little bit on what Megan has said, um, in some cases, uh, for kids that are learning English and then also attempting to learn all the basics of math and um, science and whatnot, um, uh, sometimes it's harder for them to learn those topics in English. Um, and so there is a pilot program right now where um, the kids who are struggling um, they're getting refresher courses um, after they've exited the program, or even if um, uh, they were just uh, in other special needs uh, programs, and their their test scores are going up markedly. And so, uh, over the next three years, it's part of the administration's plan to expand these programs to emphasize the basics, so that kids will do better on the MCAT scores. Um, so uh, that that's something I think we need to play out for now. <laughs> To, to see where we end up after the three-year plan. Sarah? I'm sorry, but... Yeah, all right, thanks. Yep, I mean, everyone's saying it. Uh, we don't want to be a level three school. We want to be a level two school. We um, standardize tests, I think, are challenging for some students. I've said it before um, in other forums. Um, we need to, you know, prepare students to take those tests. Um, it is about preparation in the classroom, but it's also about confidence and testing ability. And when you have a population of students who English is not their first language, um, that confidence is difficult to come by. And we need to be putting in place programs to help um, students to uh, be able to test well. And you know, I, I'll go back to a little bit more, of a, you know, um, a softer sort of side of things is, is, is the engagement in, in your education and. and that's where the social emotional learning piece comes in because if parents and students are aware of um, you know how critical education is for future success and they're they're accountable for their child's education and the children are accountable for themselves um, you're going to see improvements and we have a lot of cultural differences that I think need to um, need to be addressed and so that intervention with parents is critical and it is happening by the way I, you know I'm speaking with Dr. McIntyre he um, he does go out into the community and try and engage with those families. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing those things, and I've said it before, I don't think 
it will take much for us to get back to the place that we want to be in terms of our test scores and therefore our report card. They're also looking at the way the report card is, um, you know, how they define the, the accountability regulations, you know, for the state. They've redone them, they're looking at redoing them again. Um, so that's also impacted our scores as well. So, just an aside there. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's important to know that the level three status is an average of the scores. So Milford's turning out a good product of students at that higher level. Now there are students that are going to need additional supports and that's bringing down those test scores. It's also, the test score is a snapshot of where they are at in that current education process. It doesn't gauge how they're progressing through the, the test that we take aren't on their last day of their 12th grade year. It's years prior. So it's important to know that children that are in the special education program, children that are in the English language learners program are making effective progress as they get toward the 12th grade and graduation. So again, to try to compare our community and our scores to adjacent communities, I don't think it's fair to our student population because we have a very diverse population. We have a very high English language learners population, and those other communities around us don't have that. So we need to be specific to help those scores. We need to look at that English, lang Eng English language learner population, ensure that the supports are there for them to make effective progress and help their test scores and show a better snapshot of them of how they're doing throughout the school process. So um, Ron's question was specifically about the school choice and what are we going to do to address that issue. And I think some things we should look at is the research as to you know, when are students leaving and what can we do to help them stay in Milford and be part of our Milford school system. And most often they're leaving in kindergarten at the elementary level or choosing to leave out in another transitional time period such as high school. So if you look at the elementary when a lot of students are leaving in kindergarten it becomes an issue because then they stay out of the system from kindergarten all the way through generally to through the 12th grade and so that's when we end up with a budget issue. So if we look at the elementary programs I think we should look at enrichment at our lower elementary programs to help combat that issue and hopefully entice students and families to keep their students here in the Milford Public Schools. I do think we offer a great product like people have mentioned up here before. Um, we, our students are going on to phenomenal schools. We have some really um, incredible um, higher level schools that students are going on to after they leave and after they graduate from Milford High School. The list of colleges that students are getting accepted to is phenomenal. Uh, we offer the 19AP classes that Megan mentioned. We offer an early college program. So we have a lot of opportunities for our students. So we need to market those programs and kind of hopefully inform the public and inform the Milford residents that we have these opportunities for our students in our schools. Um, so we do have a marketing program, a subcommittee as part of the school committee. So I think we should expand upon what we have and what we're doing as part of that marketing subcommittee that we have as um, part of the school committee. Thank you. I just have to comment on this diversity issue. This diversity excuse, if you will, has been going on in Milford for the last few years. The current school committee's answer to the diversity problem is to throw more money at it. More money, more money, more of your taxpayer dollars. Why not? The seniors have unlimited funds. Let's, go, let's dig into the seniors' pockets and get more money out of them to throw at this diversity program. We be, we've beaten the diversity issue into the ground. It's time to move on. We cannot no longer continue to use diversity as an excuse for the poor, for the, for the poor quality of, our, of the education we are giving our students in Milford. Let's move on, let's solve the problem without digging into the seniors' poor pockets for more money, more money. Let's move on and let's get it done. It's about time, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, um, we have two more questions. And then I'm gonna close this because it's getting rather late. So, uh, Robin, if you have a question, and then Gerard has a question, and then I invite all of you to meet privately with all of the candidates if you have another question. But it is running late, and I know these people are busy, so two more questions, and you guys have been great. Mike, not Mike, Mike. Oh, okay. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> all right, I've, I've heard uh, Ms. Condi wants these uh, tests standardized tests. Standardized tests don't work. I'm from New York. 
originally. And we had standardized tests and we found out they didn't work because half our population was out in the food docks or farm country and we were not. So the standard test didn't work because we didn't know what a, a leader of whatever and they didn't know how to add this and that. Uh, so truthfully, I know standardized tests don't work. I've seen it in a lot of things. I also came from my last high school. We had basic and regions and honors. They split it up so that the kids could perform better in their schooling. They had a chance to go good. And then also, our school, you had to have a 75 to pass. <laughs> so you really had to work at it. Uh, my question is, and also we had college courses at the end. If, if you were up that high, you could take a college course. I was wondering whether Milford would do better in their story if they offered better programs and would interest the kids a lot more. And that's basically my question. Is, can I, can you answer, do that? I can answer both of those. Uh, standardized testing is kind of like democracy. It's a lousy form of government, but it's the best government we have. Standardized testing, it's not the cure-all, but it's the only way to compare one student to another. One, one, and keep in mind, it's an average. You can't say, oh, we have milked kids going to Harvard and Yale and so on and so forth. You can't, if you have an apple tree in your yard, you can't pick the best two apples off the tree and say, what a great tree this is. Likewise, I can't pick the two rotten apples that drop on the ground and say, what a lousy tree this is. You have to take the average. And on an average, Milford is underperforming. We have, we have advanced placement courses in, in, in the school. AP courses, you heard one of the other candidates speak about them. Last year, Milford had a 52% pass rate on the AP courses. 52%. As far as I'm concerned, that is well below where it should be. So we're doing something wrong. We need to, we need to move on. Forget about the diversity, diversity as, a, as an, an issue. Stop digging into the seniors' pockets for more money to throw money at these issues. Sit down, reason it out logically, and get it done. I, I'm, I am an expediter. I get things done. I don't talk about them. I do them. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the question. Um, I do want to say, at the elementary school level, we have 35% ELL, so diversity and diversity of people coming from other places and other countries is, is, continues to be an issue, right? Um, or not an issue, but it, you know, something that I think is, is, is good for the town in, in a lot of ways. But to your, to your other point, um, and you and I are of, of one mind on standardized tests, right? Uh, but to your other point about the how we can engage students in their education and getting them prepared for college. Um, we have, as Laura and Meg have both mentioned, 19 advanced placement courses that can um, offer college credit. Uh, Principal Hotland and Dr. McIntyre are also looking into, um, or creating already, partnerships with Framingham State and other local universities to actually do um, coursework uh, that's a college level course that you can get credit for now, right now, it's um, on the weekends, but uh, they're looking to find ways to build that into the academic rigor during the school day, so students can actually start to see what those courses would be. Um, we also have a great STEAM program, so you know the, the science, technology, engineering, arts, math, um, those programs that are sort of leading edge, um, we're doing quite a bit of, of, of that as well. So I think there are a lot of things that, that we're doing to sort of um, engage with those students who are, who, you know, are looking to college. I, I think we should work on our career pathways for our students at the high school level. I think that would be something that would be really important for our students so that they can become engaged and think about what they want to do after graduation so that they can be successful members of society and successful members of our community. So creating more pathways. Right now we have the hospitality and the banking pathway and we also have 
um, a hospitality tourism and banking pathway. So two different pathways. I'd like to see us continue with other pathways such as computer science in manufacturing and in the constru construction industry so students can make those connections to job opportunities at an early age. That's really critical for their success. They can work on their communication skills, teamwork, collaboration, um, all those communication skills will be really important whether they decide to go on to college or whether they enter directly into the career for, into the workforce right after graduation. It's a great question. Uh, I'd love to be held accountable. I think we should all be held accountable for the roles that we're looking to take. That said, I don't think this school committee is going to be able to change the MTAS coming to us. And so I think in some ways we just need to prep for it and get the kids the intervention they needed. But your point is completely valid. I actually sat down a week or so ago with the superintendent at EBT and said, tell me why you're so successful. And he said the number one reason is our kids are engaged. They come in these classrooms and they want to learn. And so I think we need to think about additional factors for how we can make that happen. I'd also love to see us get rid of any use of cell phones in the classroom so that when they're sitting there, they're paying attention and they're learning. We need to help them help themselves and find ways. It's a great point. Okay. Um, I did promise Gerard. I just wanted to make a, just a follow-up comment. When you say that BBT is so successful, they also choose not to accept the population that Milford High School educates. So they can have a 100% pass rate in their MCAS because they choose not to accept sure. students that need vocational training. I would also say that I personally I don't believe that MCAS is actually a very good predictor of life success and that's a term that I've heard principal often use repeatedly. We want these kids to be successful in life and so at the end of the day we shouldn't be focusing all our dollars on doing all the MCAS because that's not going to make these kids achieve what they need to in life. Okay, uh, I just have, I know you beat the water company to death, I wasn't here then. I got two questions, they're all both one word answers. I want to understand the court's going to decide the number. If that's the case, is there a walk away number, yes or no? And if it's yes, what's that number? This is for selecting. It, I'm sorry, a walk away number? Well, it, 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 yeah, is there a walk away number? Well, sure. Now that it's before the DPU, and that's what we discussed earlier. So there is, because we only got permission from town meeting to spend up to $63 million. If it's one cent above that, nothing can be purchased without going back to town meeting. Okay, now I got one other comment. Okay. This is just a suggestion. Yeah. Down the transfer station, you only basically take leaves and brush. Consider giving the seniors a free ticket, a free sticker. A lot of towns do. And you're here in front of all the seniors, so you know, you can <laughs> three, three stickers, three thumb stickers for seniors. It's only for trash and brush. That's all I have to get. No, I appreciate that, but as we talked about earlier, too, because of town government, that actually doesn't fall under the realm of the selectmen. So that we have to well, who suggests that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. For this the seniors, you know, you can up the other guys. The other towns do this, you know. If you want to fall and be like the big boys, you gotta give the free free stuff to seniors. <laughs> if, if we were to give uh, free stickers to seniors, somebody else is gonna pick up the tab. This is correct. The young people are working. We're on fixed income. <laughs> okay, no Some people are working. I'm on fixed income also. But uh, it's unrealistic. <laughs> No, it's not unrealistic, it's other towns do it. So don't quite say it's unrealistic. We have to study it and determine how much we have to charge for For those people that we're going to pay. And it would, certainly wouldn't be the $20 that we've charged for the last 25 years without an increase. All right? And I think that in itself is a present to the seniors. But okay. I can't answer. Words, no I can't answer. answer. No. I can't answer. <laughs> I can't answer your question without putting it to a study. We'd have to determine how much we'd have to. Well, I can tell you, if, if it's possible, Kenny will get it done. Because Kenny has helped us out in a lot of things. So. Okay. All I can tell you. Is we're gonna. <laughs> Okay. I want to thank you all for coming, especially the candidates. Thank you all.